All right. Thank you all so much for coming for our lunchtime Q and A event. Um, my name is Laura Sandino. I have recently started my new position as the events and outreach coordinator at the Center on Democracy. Um, we're a hub on democracy um, on campus on all things democracy, and we've been kind of putting together events, um, bringing in speakers. And today's event is a Q&A on the Bill of Rights. So basically, um, we have here Professor Aziz, Aziz Hook, uh, um, and Professor William Baud. Um, and yeah, so your role today will be kind of to ask any questions you uh, have on the Bill of Rights, and they will be here to answer. And please feel free to get some food. I think I ordered too much. So thank you all for coming. Should we start by introducing ourselves? Sure. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, so my name is Will Bode, and I am a, like Aziz, I'm a law professor at the law school. Uh, I teach principally constitutional law and federal courts, just sort of about the role and jurisdiction of the federal courts, as well as a class called the conflict of laws on the competing jurisdictions of states and nations. Uh, I was an undergrad here uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I'm Aziz Hawk. Um, I also teach at the law school. Um, this year I'm teaching our uh, introductory property class, uh, a class on the 14th Amendment. Uh, in previous years I've taught federal courts like Will. Um, uh, I've also taught our basic constitutional class, um, but I haven't done that in um, four or five years. Um, so why did we, I, why did we open it up and um, people can throw out things that are of interest to them and we will do our best I think to answer them. I think we have quite different domains uh, <laughs> in of focus or interest within the very large field of constitutional law. And I, and I suspect that we can do some, but not all of the things that people are like sort of wanting to be interested in, but we'll do our best to be a bit about what we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, <laughs> can you introduce yourself and just say theater or something that yeah, yeah, yeah. situates yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, my name's Maud. I'm an uh, MBA MVP here. Um, before this, I was in Seattle working. And my question has to do with the Second Amendment. So I got into shooting over the last three years. And as part of that, I've read a lot of arguments online about you know what, what must have been meant uh, by the Second Amendment. And one of the big arguments that I see is around this idea that it was a collective, a collective right, not an individual right. And so what I wanted to uh, ask you is what's your opinion on that argument? Um, and I'd be especially interested in you know, if, if you think that's a valid argument, um, just where else can we see like collecting like, like what would be the basis for that that we can see elsewhere? And and it doesn't have to be in the constitution, it could be in other uh systems of law, but I just want to understand. Well, I, I can say something about um the academic debate. Um, um um I can say something about the idea of the collective right, which I think is um an idea that's that's ambiguous and might take several different forms. Um, so the place where the debate that you're describing um, takes place in the court is the decision um, initially uh, on the part of the Supreme Court recognizing an individual entitlement under the Second Amendment to District of Columbia versus Heller. Um, and in, in the Heller decision, um, uh, both the uh, majority written by Justice Scalia and the uh, uh, dissent written by Justice Stevens uh, marshal um, uh, quite a wide range of historical and textual evidence um, within, from within the Second Amendment, and in particular, um, glossing its prefiguratory clause. Uh, for the two positions that I think your question alludes to, the idea that um, to the extent the Second Amendment rec recognizes a set of interests, 
those interests are un individual interests, those interests are understood uh, to be shaped and filtered through the role of state militias referenced at the beginning of the, uh, of the amendment um, play, uh, or are thought to have played in 1791. Um, or alternatively, that the um, amendment identifies and enshrines uh, a right that, that um, uh, sounds in the individual's possession and potential use of the firearm um, without reference to the role that that individual plays in, 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 a, in a militia. Um, the majority rules for the second and not the first ruling, uh, so the second but not the first version uh, of that argument, um, and that individual right is extended and it's been uh, applied against the states, um, uh, it's been uh, deployed against um, uh, limitations upon uh, ca public carry rules, uh, and then earlier this week, um, was tested with respect to uh, the limitation on individuals who have restraining orders in domestic violence cases against them. Um, so the, the individual version, as opposed to the, the uh, uh, mediated by state militia version of the Second Amendment is presently the uh, the one that is accepted by and enforced by the court. And I think that what one thinks of that depends upon both the methodological premises that you bring to the table in reading constitutional text, and also how you weigh the evidence that's presented, mm -hmm. particularly in the Heller reviews. Um, so very, very briefly on collective versus individual rights, there's a number of different ways in which you might talk of entitlements of various sorts being held by collectives. Um, uh, for example, there are uh, collectives such as religious faiths or churches or synagogues or mosques. There are collectivities that exercise what are recognized as First Amendment rights, like the press, uh, which might have an institutional or a corporate form. Uh, there are corporations that might exercise certain entitlements. That's a kind of collective, right? Uh, and there are things like, well, there are entities that are that are loosely characterized as civil society, like associations or unions that might have uh, collective rights. Then there are collective rights that might be held and exercised at the level of polity. So we might uh, talk about the collective rights of the people, which is a phrase that's used in several places in uh, the Second Amendment, uh, either at the national or at the state level, to exercise a certain sort of uh, authority. Um, so, so the idea of collective rights is, is plural and can be mapped both in terms of the, uh, the Bill of Rights itself, but also in, in, in broader terms um, or in, in other contexts. Um, and at least insofar as the Second Amendment's interpretation uh, goes, doesn't really have much traction anymore in the field. So I just had two thoughts. But so again, the second amendment context, for those who don't have it at the at the forefront of their mind, part of the debate about the second amendment comes from the peculiar phrasing and structure of the second amendment, which is uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. And so there's a there's a ton of sort of scholarship and case law about this. What is the relevance of that first thing, the militia, to that second thing, the right? And that's what gives rise to the, the debate about, does that mean that it's a right to be in a militia? Is this just sort of uh, fluff? Is it just sort of telling us they like militias, but also they have a right? Um, and I think, you know, my own view is that uh, there might even just be a spectrum. You know, so the extreme sort of collective rights position would be, this is a right only held by government-run militias. And so, an individual can never make a second amendment claim because it's really the militia's right. And the extreme claim in the direction, more or less marked by Heller, is that the first clause is more or less fluff, that there's just an individual right to keep and bear arms, and the militia is an interesting historical reason for that, and has nothing to do with it. Uh, I, I tend to think that the right answer is somewhere in between, that there, an individual can make right to keep and bear arms claims, 
but that the militia uh, purpose of the right is relevant to a lot of questions like what kind of weapons does that cover? What kind of regulations are permissible? Why do we do this? Um, which is not what the Supreme Court said, but they may say that one day. Um, I, I also think the Second Amendment collective rights term is usually is an example of what, what is called as sort of the collective rights at the level of the polity. When people are talking about a collective right to be in a militia, they don't mean uh, a private group of people operating as a militia, like a church or a labor union or a political party, right? There are, in fact, there are a lot of law that, that is very skeptical of that, uh, of you know, groups of armed, of private armed people, you know, marauding the countryside. They don't have a collective right. The collective right that the, that the theory is referring to is more or less the state, the mm -hmm. state's rights to constitute a great militia. And a, a fact that's easy to forget is that when the Bill of Rights itself is adopted, a lot of the rights had something of that flavor because at the time the constitutional structure is federalist. So we have states that have sort of a very broad police power over, over almost everything at the, at the state level and a national government that's thought to be in some way of, of limited and enumerated powers. And the Bill of Rights by itself operates only to restrain the national government, leaving states free to do things within the constraints of their own state constitutional traditions and state courts and a set of, of other institutional characters. So all of the rights that we now think of as kind of basic American rights against all of our levels of government were at the time rights only against one level of government, which might then give room for the states to have some some more say in the structure of those rights, the enforcement of those rights, or how they how they work. So, so we I, I we were talking at the beginning about my tendency to fill a Yeah, um, <laughs> and give long answers. So I'm going to not give as long answers now because it's like clearly a bunch of. <laughs> I was a little worried that that was going to be like a long question. Okay. Why do you think it's the most misunderstood amendment? By the American public. I mean, that assumes the American public knows about the rights. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, you know, uh, uh, that knocks out uh, a number of rights. You know, that there's like waves of people out there reading US USA Today and wondering about why there are troops quartered in their home. <laughs> um, so you'd have to, it's, it's, so, so the denominator is the rights that people know about, and then the numerator is how confused they are about those rights. <laughs> That was my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, like, no, I, I think. But I think you know, like, I think, like, the Fifth Amendment is one right that I think is somewhat misunderstood. Wait, that, the which bit of the Fifth Amendment? No, like, right to be silent in. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's misunderstood how? As in, I think the rule is to be a sort of an indication of someone that's violent to the state of the court or someone who wants to be police, so that they can do their right. Um, yeah, uh, I was going to nominate the right to counsel. So the Sixth Amendment contains the right to assistance of counsel in criminal cases, which I mean, maybe it's not fair to call it misunderstood, but which has is one of these rights that has been whose modern meaning is sort of radically transformed from its meaning at the time it was enacted. So now it's the basis for the idea that if you can't afford a lawyer, one will be appointed before the case begins, and often before even lots of stages of investigation can begin. And so it's the basis for the funding of our public defense system and criminal defense lawyers. Um, and, you know, it says right to counsel in the Constitution, so you might think those two things are related. Uh, but for the first hundred years of the career of the Sixth Amendment, it was thought to mean something different. It was thought to mean it's just the right to have a lawyer if you can afford one. Uh, which may sound sort of silly like a right, right? It's the right, you know, you have the right not to sleep under a bridge if you can afford not to sleep under a bridge, thanks. Um, but it was not nothing because there were proceedings that otherwise might try to stop people from bringing in lawyers even if they could. Uh, that was an important, unfair aspect of some uh, British trials. So it's thought at least to be important to establish, you don't have to go it alone. You know, they can't force you to, to sit in the dock by yourself, you can have a lawyer. And the connection between the modern practice of, of a, Large state funded apparatus of defense and the Constitution, maybe. I think there's two ways of thinking about your question. So, Will's done yeah. one way. So, one way is you could say, well, look, I have a view about what the substance of the, of the right is. And here's what the court and everyone teed up by the court thinks. And that's that, that's that question. 
The second question, which I, which is the other way of interpreting your question, is to say, well, look, you know, there's the right, and we're we're, we're going to take what the court says is given, and then we're going to look at how people understand the right, and 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 you would look at that point not at the gap between your understanding and the court's understanding, but the gap between what the court says the law is and what in, in, in fact the law is. Um, I, there's lots and lots and lots of work done on that second question. It's called the gap problem in legal scholarship generally, uh, the gap being the gap between the law and the books and the law uh, in the world. Uh, famously, when the Supreme Court had a firmer rule against school prayer, uh, school prayer was prevalent a lot in large parts of the country. Um, is that an ignorance problem? Is that a willingness to defy the law problem? Don't know. Um, uh, the, the policing example, um, I think I think it I, I would read it or gloss it the other way, which is the Supreme Court has said you have a right to remain silent. It's implemented it through uh what are called Miranda warnings that everyone knows because everyone has seen a cop show at some point in their life. Maybe that will stop now that everyone just watches TikTok. <laughs> they're like they're like you have the right I don't know it's like the TikTok video stopped so I don't know why <laughs> uh, so maybe the cultural uh awareness of Miranda will change as people consume different kinds of media that's a possibility. But but as a matter of practice um uh, the, the, the police forces have developed a suite of tools to work around uh, the invocation of Miranda. And so there's pretty good evidence that the only people who invoke a right to silence and stick to it are the people who don't have experience of the criminal justice system. So younger, minority, women, uh, and first time offenders tend to be uh, uh, the ones who are more likely to uh, even if they're told you have a right to remain silent, actually speak. Whereas older, uh, in, in particular, people who have repeat experiences with the criminal justice system uh, tend to be the people who know that they should are their self interest to serve, like keep your mouth shut. Um, so that's an example of a of a case where uh, the right, whether you think whatever you think about what the court's done with it and Miranda and the like cases. Um, it means something totally different on the ground and is actually understood by people and applied by people in ways that are, um, I think most people, whatever their priors normatively think that the present distribution in which the guilty tend to invoke Miranda, invoke their right to remain silent, and the innocent don't, is almost the opposite of what we should have in the world. Um, I actually want to ask about the Ninth Amendment. Um, it's very broad. Uh, it's not often used in jurisprudence, I don't think. Why are the common law reasons for it to be there? Like, why was it put in the Constitution? Why do decisions usually not rely on it, given that it gives kind of such a broad um, statement on, you know, the granting of rights? Um, yeah, why is it there? So I can answer the why it's there question, uh, just as a historical <laughs> matter. So the the Constitution did not originally contain a Bill of Rights. It originally contains the separation of powers and, and the structure of the government and then stops. The when the people of states are asked to ratify the Constitution, a lot of people say, well, we'd feel better about it if it had a Bill of Rights. And so there's a kind of promise. If you ratify it, we'll we'll consider a Bill of Rights. And so then they do. And when they're considering the Bill of Rights uh, in Congress to go out to the states, one, two sets of worries that are raised are, are these enough rights? You know the the act of spelling out these rights. Will this, you know, will will our incompleteness come back to haunt us later? And people have raised kind of what seemed to them the silly examples of the time. You know, are we going to put in the right to wear a hat whenever you please? You know, is that uh, is, is that protected? Or, you know, the right to get up whenever you want. And so they're just basic principles of liberty that. And so so one worry is the bill of rights might be incomplete. Another related worry, uh, which is sort of stoked by some of the people who initially. Close the Bill of Rights is that ironically, increasing rights will also increase the government's power. That the people will, will feel differently about the stakes of a question of a government power if they know the individual rights are there as backstops. So the initial sort of promise is you don't need a Bill of Rights because the government's power will be so limited that it couldn't ever get anywhere close to your rights anyway. And one worry is once we include rights, that won't be true anymore. We'll be more inclined to read the government's power in a really broad way because the rights have been backstop. And so 
James Madison proposes the language that eventually becomes the Ninth Amendment, he claims as a response to, as a solution to these two problems. Mm -hmm. The rights might be incomplete, so don't worry, we'll say there are more. Uh, and people might infer from the existence of the rights that, that the government has other powers or that you don't have other rights, so we'll say you shouldn't make that inference. Now, I don't know that it's been successful uh, in blocking us from making that inference over time, but that was the end. Yeah. I, I think I would emphasize the second of Will's reasons, which is that the idea that uh, so that the key verb in the Ninth Amendment is the word construe. And who does construing? Maybe legislatures construe the Bill of Rights when they decide what to, what to, what to, what laws to pass. The executive construes it when they decide when and how to enforce those laws, and then judges construe them. And so one way of thinking about it is that it's a blanket instruction um, not to draw the negative inference from the existence of, of rights that are identified either in the Bill of Rights or in you know, Article 4 has things that are look like Bill of Rights, look like rights. You don't draw negative inferences from that fact. Um, it's worth remembering that um, the 1780s and 90s is the very first modern period of constitutional writing. And there's simultaneously constitutions, roughly simultaneously, constitutions being written in the United States, in Poland, and in France. And each of these, um, and then a little later, there's one really interesting one, like Corsica, which, was, uh, which Rousseau is quite involved in. Um, each of these uses slightly different strategies for trying to figure out the restraint problem, right? The how do you, how do you um, prevent the people who you're giving all this power to from abusing their authority, right? This is what economists call the agency problem. And if you look at all of these constitutions together, one of the things you that it's hard that you walk away with, I think, is the sense that we're trying to do something we've never that nobody's really done before. And we're just gonna throw a bunch of stuff at the wall across these across these three constitutions. <laughs> this is how you learn in, in any environment, right? In any policy making environment. You try things out and you see what works and what doesn't. And so what you would expect to see in that context are strategies that work in theory, but that might not work as well in practice. And maybe one of the reasons that they don't work as well in practice is that they have, that they contain a term that's not stable or determinate enough to give people an anchor. Mm -hmm. right? That might be what happened with the Ninth Amendment. Mm -hmm. That might be what happened with something called the Republican uh, form of government clause. Right? If you don't have something that you can, uh, that, that you can, that, are, that is informationally not particularly demanding, that you can give to your legislator, your uh, official, your judge, who's administrating or applying the law, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the lesson of the next one. I have a question about the Sixth Amendment. I guess I'm just wondering, it seems like what a fair trial is is kind of a changing and like a very effective I'm thinking back to like during COVID when you know, all the courts were online, or even more recently, like the judicial conference allowing like audio streaming in civil cases. So I guess I'm wondering, what do you see a fair trial becoming? What is this all building towards? I think the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to a fair trial. Or is it speedy and public? Oh, sorry, speedy and public. Sorry, I don't the public aspect of like yeah. the broadcast on the screen. What do you like? Do you so it's a speedy and public, just to be clear. It's just speedy and public. I don't have a yeah. I have it in my pocket. Speedy is public. It's good to have you. So I guess I'm wondering that, like, public. How do you see that changing with more technology? Yeah, well, so this is, I mean, uh, this was an, an issue that was definitely sort of like transformed in multiple ways by all the closures during, during COVID. Um, so the the idea of a public trial means that the doors in the courtroom in almost every you know criminal trial in the country are are unlocked. Often they're actually closed, but they're unlocked. You can just if you know the trial is there, which is not easy, and if you can get to the metal detectors, then you can just so wander in and see and see what's happening. And you don't need a particular reason for being there. And absent sort of narrowly tailored specific reasons to keep somebody out, you know, the informant is testifying, and this is the person who we're worried is going to kill them. Um, you, you don't need a need a reason for being there. Um, during uh, you know all the shutdowns, a lot of courtrooms, even courtrooms that were physically open in person, often were not letting just people off the street in, and so then they had to figure out what to do about that, or the courtroom was things were happening remotely. 
So uh, there was litigation and challenges saying, you know, if the if the proceeding is happening remotely, then you should let the public give the public access to the Zoom link, which on the one hand uh, was in some ways even more costless than normal presence in the trial. It's harder to be disruptive. It's easier to, to block you. But on the other hand, uh, I think the courts didn't like it because normally nobody bothers to show up to anything that's not the trial of Sam Bankman Freed or something else. It's like the Donald Trump, somebody in the news. And suddenly, you know, there were there were you know random reporters and and information gatherers and troublemakers who just kind of wanted to sit in on a bunch of a bunch of proceedings, which uh, was not what the courts were used to. So now, as things have gone back to being open, in essence, more public, they've also in a way become less public because now, if you want to go to a trial, you have to physically go to that jurisdiction and find the courthouse and hear what's going to happen. I, I'd make two points about the question. The first point is is an observation. I think that the latest statistics are that 97% of federal criminal cases are resolved through plea bargains. They're not resolved through trials. I think the, or otherwise. The, number, the number is, I think, somewhere near 99% at the state level. Um, we don't have a system of trying people for guilt or innocence in criminal cases. We perform that in the Bankman Freed case, um, <laughs> but in the overwhelming majority of cases, we have a system of bureaucratized, what some um, critics of the system have called uh, assembly line criminal justice. So the notion that we have a system characterized by public, speedy is another question. And notice that there might be a trade-off between publicity and, and speediness. Um, the notion that we have a system of public trials is not, I think, an accurate understanding of our criminal justice system. That's the first point. The second point is that the concern about publicity that you've raised is not limited to um, criminal trials, although criminal trials are the ones that are mentioned in the Sixth Amendment. Uh, Courts have also found that there is a right somewhere between the first and, and he doesn't like that. <laughs> That's fine. Somewhere between the first and the and the and the Fifth Amendment to public um, publicness in civil cases, and um, this is now increasingly being tested. So, for example, in the case challenging. Uh, that the US government filed challenging some of Google's um, uh, bundling practices with respect to their uh, search tool, um, large portions of that trial were closed to reporters because Google says we can't have our experts testifying about the PageRank algorithm when there are reporters in the room. Our colleague, Brandy Picker, has said, hey, hold on a second. How on earth can anyone make an informed judgment about whether the uh, antitrust violations here actually exist? Surely a matter of enormous public importance, uh, a matter of public importance for the public at large, well beyond the scope of the relevance of a single person being convicted. We can't see that. So these, I, this, the question of publicity and trials, I think, is is one that has resonance outside the context of the criminal cases that the Sixth Amendment is concerned. What is the relationship between the in, within the First Amendment? What is the relationship between the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and what should that relationship be? So, like, what does the court say it is, and what should you think it should? <laughs> But one comes after the other. <clears throat> well, <laughs> making a joke. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Supreme Court has a picture of those of the amendments and from view a sort of intention that one of them is a sort of pro-religion amendment and one is a kind of pro-secularism amendment. And then the court likes to emphasize and phrase play in the joints. That it's important to construe both of both amendments to be not too broad, otherwise they would run into one another. If you if you interpreted the pro-religion part of the Fair Exercise Clause and the pro-secularism part of the Zimmerman Clause too much, you could end up with a conflict. They say it's important to 
say there must be play in the joints. That's I think the kind of the in broad strokes the picture that that the doctrine has put forward. Although in other places, the court recognizes both doctrines as serving kind of similar overlapping roles. So there's a principle that the government shouldn't discriminate between different religious sects. They shouldn't have rules that favor Christians over Jews or whatever. And it is located that in both free exercise, it would, have, it would prohibit the free exercise of the disfavored sects and an establishment would be somewhat establishing for the government to establish a favorite sect or not, or to probe too deeply into the internal workings of the church. It's sometimes that it, or in that, in that, in that kind of thing, um, which is, I don't know. Then the diagram was very complicated that they both opposed, but sometimes, sometimes overlap. Uh, the one thing I'll say is just in keeping with our, our earlier thoughts about federalism and collective rights, the First Amendment, this is one of those provisions where to think about it in its original context is very different than how we think about it today. So when the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, that is at the time understood to protect the established religions that a few states still had. I think Connecticut, maybe one other, had a state established religion. Um, yeah, Massachusetts. And so at the time, that was seen as, as very much a federalist provision that Congress wasn't going to get involved in the religion thing, not because there would be no establishments of religion, because that would be up to the, the good people of Massachusetts to decide what the established church should be. And only later, when we sort of transform the right into an individual right against the states, do we have that same kind of question. So, so the recent, I'll, I'll just build on that, the recent uh, move in the court has been to narrow the effectual scope of the establishment clause. So it's, I can't think of a case in which uh, a plaintiff or a litigant making an establishment clause claim has won, even with uh, an argument for discrimination as between different denominations. Well, Senate Tabor had an establishment clause argument in addition to the clause. But it leaned on the establishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, right. Rolled but, into but, a ball. Yeah. But it rolled it into a ball, and, and it can be explained. <laughs> That's the case about something called a ministerial exception. Um, it's hard to think of any case in which the establishment clause would has had a standing effect during the Roberts Court. Um, in contrast, the, the prevailing view among scholars is that, is that the course in the last three years has dramatically changed the nature of the religious liberty right. It used to be a right against uh, purposefully singling out religion as such, and now it has become what some scholars call a most favored nation right. So if if there is a general law and it has an exception for X, it also has to have a, an exception for religion, assuming that religion is similar enough to X. Now, even my stating that or to suggest there's lots of problems or lots of uh, uh, complexities, not problems, complexities and how you think about that. You know, when is a law general? When does it have exceptions? What counts as an exception? How do you decide whether an exception for this is like an exception for that? Um, uh, especially if you're not supposed to have views about the quality or the nature um, as opposed to the sincerity of religious beliefs. Um, um, it's hard to know how broad or narrowly that uh, version or that account of religious liberty will end up being. Um, but I think it is safe to say that the trajectory, you know, if they were if they were stock tickers, the establishment clause would be would be would be going the way of we work. <laughs> and uh the free exercise clause. I don't know. <laughs> uh, going, going, going up. Um, um, um I, I don't have a, I, I'm really skeptical of sort of people who, or, or, or efforts to say, well, there's, there's this, here's like this obviously right answer to this really hard problem. So the problem of how to manage conflict between religious identities in the public sphere is one that goes back I mean, clearly, it, 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 it haunts European and Western political thought because of the uh, ferocity of the European wars of religion, but it's obviously hardly confined to Europe or America. And to say that 
there is to say that you have the way to address the problem that those two elements of the First Amendment are trying to grapple with, I think, is um, I, I I certainly don't know what the right what the what the normatively desirable way of, of managing those conflicts are. Um, I, and and you know whether whether you think that the the First Amendment's two clauses embodies some effectual set of managerial tools, I think is a very difficult question. Um, and and I, I'm I'm very skeptical of people who think they have the right answer to that question. I certainly don't. Thank you so much. So far, one of the questions I have in the case of the United States, for example, is has there been a thought, for example, about uh, one of the tools that Germany created, which I believe is actually created by them, which is these uh, links better or uh, basically rights that are inalienable, stone rights. I understand that in the German constitution, human dignity is a right that you can't like have the constitution vote in favor or against them. That's default uh, there. So I was thinking, okay, in the states, I understand that basically, as we mentioned before, in the Federalist Papers, mm -hmm. when we were drafting the Constitution, the idea is basically they establish the principles of government based on you know previous institutions and the idea of self determination. So that principle that if you would have, you would need a huge majority to make change in the Constitution, therefore uh, leading some mobility for different generations to uh, not just uh, live on previous rules. So I was thinking in the states in the current situation, which uh, you know there's a lot of volatility in which one side or another can get power and go and uh, make important changes to the law. Is has that been thought out uh, like uh, creating some or establishing some mechanism to getting some principles or ideas uh, completely into stone and therefore not being able to be changed, or is that just out of the question? I, I think it's too comparative law. Um, perspectives on that. Um, so the first comparative law perspective is that is that in in the constitutional law of other countries, not of the United States, there is a, an idea that originated with the Indian Supreme Court, but that has diffused around the world, of a constitution that has basic structures, where the basic structure of the constitution cannot be altered either by laws or more interestingly, through constitutional amendments. So the Indian Supreme Court starting, um, I'm gonna mispronounce the name, the Kesavananda, you know the name of this? Yeah. Kesavananda, Kesavananda, I think it's Kesavananda Mills, something around along that, those lines, and I apologize for not having it uh, to hand. Uh, Hell invalidated a constitutional, a formal constitutional amendment to the Indian constitution on the ground that it was incompatible with the basic commitments to democracy in the, in the uh, embodied in the original constitution. And that idea has spread around the world and it's become uh, un under certain conditions, a, uh, a pro-democracy device, a way of preventing certain kinds of um, of incumbent power through constitutional amendments. And in other contexts, it's been used in more problematic ways as a, as a means of resisting the, the enlargement of democracy. So it's an ambiguous principle. But, but there is that idea that exists uh, out in the comparative constitutional law world, the basic structure that has no parallel in the US context. Uh, the second point that I would make is you're absolutely right to say that the German basic law that's enacted, believe it comes into force in 1949, um, in the wake of the horrors of the Holocaust uh, in particular, uh, and because of the Holocaust, makes dignity inviolable in, in its first sentence. And the orientation, not just of that law, but other provisions of German, Germany's basic law, such as Article 21, which has a mechanism for uh, banning political parties that are anti-democratic or that have affiliations or uh, ideological sympathy, to, ideological parallels to the Nazi party. This is a constitution that is that's, that's organized around the idea of preventing the horrors that happened from 1933 onward. Um, today in Germany, 
the alternative for German Germany party, the AFD, uh, runs on a platform that is not particularly lightly disguised anti-Semitism, explicit invocation of Nazi symbols, and overt uh, demands for ethnic cleansing of Muslims. The AFD wins, or the, the AFD until recently had not won any elected office. This summer it won a municipal office in Florentia. Um, uh, it is um, slated to win uh, state level elections in Thuringia and Hess next year. And at the national level gets about 20% of the vote. As a project, uh, as a test case for uh, using a constitution to entrench a set of human, humane, human rights or humane values against backsliding, right? Whether those values sound in terms of preventing a repetition of the horror of the, Holo of the Holocaust, the genocide, or whether it's understood in terms of the anti-democratic authoritarian quality of the Nazi party, Germany is not a great example. Uh, so, two other things. so the federal constitution does contain two explicit limits on the ability to amend the federal constitution, but neither of them are about individual basic rights. So one of them is the rule that no state can be deprived of its equal representation in the Senate without its consent. That is, you can't reapportion the Senate to be on a you know, fair popular innovation basis unless all the states agree. And the other is that no law can be made about uh, uh, authorizing the outlawing the slave trade before 1808. So it no longer matters in time, so you can't go back in time. But the two instances that the, that the federal constitution has of that are not are sort of the opposite of what you might expect. They're not basic human rights, they're basic anti-democratic questionable features of the constitution that they recognize might be controversial and therefore try to put beyond the amendment process. At the state level, there have occasionally been versions of this argument made about state constitutions, and state constitutions are much easier to amend than the federal constitution, so it comes up a little bit more. But my impression is that they've not really gotten any legs, uh, in part because state constitutional law has available a bunch of uh, procedural doctrines that state judges can manipulate if they really want to stop a constitutional amendment. So state court judges are notorious for employing things like the single subject rule, which requires in many places a ballot initiative or constitutional amendment to only deal with one topic. And then what is a topic to be, uh, to be manipulated in, in embarrassing ways and things like that. So that's gonna be a less honest way to grapple with the problem, but it's probably what happens. Um, I think, thank you so much. Um, I'm, my name is Kevin Gua, I'm a first year at the college. Uh, my, my question is also about the Ninth Amendment, but it's a little bit more out there. <laughs> Um, and so recently, I, I actually, I came across um, one of the articles you wrote, which is about the general law and like the 14th Amendment, or more specifically, the privileges or immunities clause, which was also kind of like rendered a nullity by the Supreme Court in um, the slaughterhouse cases. Um, but I was wondering, like, because like, um, like the background you gave on like general law rights and like, basically, like it says like, so like people like there are like still like implicit rights and federal courts like use this you know, idea to even before the 14th amendment sometimes like strike down state state actions and so, like very specific like jurisdictional cases um but i was wondering like how do, does like does the ninth amendment like potentially embody the idea of general rights uh and like if so like does that change like like first of all, how the amendment, how we believe the amendment operates, and then like as well as like our interpretation of it or something like that. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna say yes. This is a little in the weeds, but let's just, just try to a piece of context that may be useful to think about this. If you think about uh, British constitutional law, where there is no formal document, the Constitution that's the Supreme Law of the Land, there are a series of enactments and traditions and rules that are the Constitution. Nonetheless, there, there are constitutional rights and they matter in courts, often because uh, an executive action might be held to violate these rights if it isn't fully authorized by statute 
or a law that's somewhat ambiguous might be interpreted in light of the inherited rights of Englishmen, I guess. And that's one of the pieces of constitutional tradition that kind of comes over to America for a while that, that you know, plays second, ends up playing second fiddle as we valorize the written constitution of the Bill of Rights, but it's still out there and it's still a working doctrine, even when the Bill of Rights is enacted. <laughs> I think that's a good candidate for the kind of thing the Ninth Amendment might have protected. It might have said, we're enumerating these rights, we're going to create them. But by doing that, we're not we're not preempting or displacing the idea of also courts thinking about unwritten rights sometimes. That said, the, the basic principle of those kinds of unwritten rights is that they can't trump the clear written law and act by the legislature. That if, you know, if, if Congress wants to enact a law that specifically overrides some common law principle, it's very clear they're doing that. It was not widely regarded as a, a place for the courts to intervene. So the ultimate strength of these kinds of rights, even that kind of theory, wouldn't necessarily be a strong one. Uh, I hope you don't mind my asking about the 14th, but if I ask, like, how do you think about uh, some of the terms, the general terms that are used? It says liberty and not freedom, and does that matter? And some of the phrasing is really interested in it in the process, like what's due uh, the process and the process that the experts think very about it. I'm not sure that there's a difference between liberty and freedom. The word, the idea of the, the, the political theory discourse on freedom as such is, I think, a more recent phenomenon than um, the discourse on liberty. So freedom becomes a um, a more important word in the 20th century, um, but that's not to say that at that at that there's a point in time or even now that there's a crisp and clear distinction between those terms. Um, in the context of the Fourteenth Amendment, freedom obviously, uh, sorry, liberty obviously uh, connotes freedom from uh, physical restraint, given the enacting context of the 14th Amendment. Um, and even the fact that I just have to articulate that in terms that essentially treated liberty and freedom as synonyms or close to synonyms tells you something. Um, with respect to um, due process, um, there are, there are, the, the doctrine at the moment draws a distinction uh, between uh, the idea that there are certain uh, entitlements that are substantive entitlements. There, there are, there are what we'd recognize as almost um, uh, as as species of independent independent negative rights that cannot be eliminated without uh, under any circumstance. And that that line of cases is sometimes called substantive due process. The most prominent of that of those of those cases, of course, is abortion where the Supreme Court eliminated uh, um, or overruled the precedents uh, that recognized a substantive due process right to abortion. Um, as I read the, that opinion, um, the court didn't overrule earlier precedent that recognized something like a substantive due process right with respect to other elements of bodily autonomy. So there's an early 20th century case concerning compulsory sterilizations that I think is best read in, in due process terms, but I think still remains the law. The other element or the other strand of due process concerns what, what procedures the government must use with respect to uh, something that looks like an adjudication that results in the loss of life, liberty, or property. And in that context, you have very, very varied lines of, uh, of, of cases describing the necessary quanta of procedures in different kinds of adjudicative uh, contexts. One thing that's always struck me about those, those cases is that uh, they don't apply to legislatures. To legislatures. So if, if, a, if, if a legislature um, um, extinguishes a entitlement, um, it might be a taking 
but it almost certainly will not be a due process violation. And that distinction has always struck me as peculiar. It's a, there's a cliff edge quality to the distinction between different kinds of institutions to which the due process clause applies. And I've never quite understood why it exists. Um, so if, if we are to claim originalism as sort of the <clears throat> current, you know, uh, viewpoint of the court and sort of American jurisprudence that's developing, how or will there be at some point a split between how courts view the fifth and fourteenth amendments due process clause and what might be the implications of that? Um, well, this is a so the Bill of Rights, the was for the Bill of Rights enacted in 1791. The other due process clause and other rights of the 14th Amendment Act in 1867 or 68, depending on who you ask. There's a general, like a general agreement for people to believe in originalism that the relevant moment for any given constitutional text is the moment that it is enacted. So you do need to have different sort of original meanings for different times. But for parts of the constitutional text that are obviously in dialogue with one another, it might be, many people think, that they enact the due process clause in the 14th Amendment, believing that it means the same thing as the due process clause in the 5th Amendment. And so there's a kind of like a linkage of the two. Now, there's another problem. Suppose they believed that the two meant the same because they didn't understand their 1791 history as well as we do now. Then how does the equation work? Do we, do we uh, some would say, update the 5th Amendment to match the 14th Amendment? Do we backdate the 14th Amendment to match the 5th Amendment? Or do we give up on the idea they mean the same thing? That, that is a, a trilemma, I guess, mm -hmm. that the court would eventually have to confront if it if it acknowledged this divergence. And I don't think there's a received view of what's the right answer. Yes. I think we probably have time for one more question. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned the idea of, uh, I'm a teacher, by the way. I uh, work for IoT, also I'm doing a master's in health sciences here. So forgive, it, forgive me if I'm completely naive, but um, you mentioned something so quite too far, if you don't mind. Um, the, the idea of the gap in law is that the idea of like us trying to figure out like implementation gap, kind of like written law versus law as it's practice. Is there something that I could like read more about that? Is that a resource that you would recommend? Um, that's a that's a, a, a publication called the Annual Review of Law and Social Science, God, which yeah. is as the name suggests, an annual <laughs> and a review. Uh, and there was a and, and the and the chapters of that in that uh, uh, journal do very good jobs of summarizing what you might call the interdisciplinary literature on law. And I, I as my recollection is that, that there has been one on the gap problem, as it's called, yeah. within the last. 10 years. Okay. So that's okay. a good source for that. Perfect. Okay. And then the um, more, so you mentioned irony. I guess in short, the question that I've been, so this has to do with the fourth amendment, I believe, search and seizure. Um, so working as an EMT, working in the medical setting, um, you know, the issue of how to properly care and manage uh, psychiatric patients um, comes into play all the time. And so um, I guess in my mind, there's a kind of cruel irony in the sense that oftentimes if you force unreasonable search and seizure onto people, you know, in cases where maybe it's a gray area where potentially it's not right or reasonable, but given the realities of the situation, that's what happens. Those who tend to resist that tend to be even more forcibly, unreasonably searched, seized, whatnot. And so is there something, and I mean, obviously this speaks to the implementation gap a little bit, right? But in this kind of cruel irony, is there a way, is there something I'm missing there? Is there a way for me to feel better about that? You know? Um, so I think I, you're referring to an extraordinarily complex social problem, really? which is, <laughs> yeah. which, which, which involves, you know, A, um, people with different spectrums of what you've characterized as disorders, right. which make it more or less uh, difficult for them to perceive and to respond to instructions that maybe the modal person would be able to respond to. Led on that is a set of uh, assumptions and beliefs that people have because of their own 
racial identity and their own experience of how others treat them because of their racial identity that have fairly sharp impingements on the way that encounters between members of the public and the police transpire. Um, and led on top of that is a set of questions of institutional choice. Is it an EMT? Is it a police officer? Is it a social worker? Is it somebody with psychiatric health training who is called out as a first responder under particular situations? Um, I, I don't think that the formal law of the Fourth Amendment uh, uh, rules for what, uh, under what circumstances a search or a seizure could be made by an officer in the absence of a warrant, uh, which are different from the rules that cover non-police officers, I don't think that they account for any of those complexities. So at least the law is far too, at least the constitutional law in this field, it is far too coarse to address your problem, the concerns that you're raising. That's not the place where it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen in regulations, internal guidance, and in terms of you know, whether, say, a municipality funds its police department to do psychiatric interventions, or whether it funds, um, EMTs or whether it comes people with public health training. Well, I have one last thing I'd say. I think it's a general feature of our legal system and maybe all legal systems that the law begins to cut especially sharply against those who are perceived to question legal system. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> to resist arrest uh it comes strictly, you know, yeah. even you to, to lie to officers whether you've committed committed a crime, even if it's not actually a crime, then it becomes a crime. And that yeah, that's a that's a very general feature of our legal system. Right. That has the obvious troubling consequence that therefore the uh edge becomes especially sharp against various kinds of marginalized communities. Right. It might also be a necessary condition for the survival of the legal system in the long run. I'm not sure. But regardless, it's a feature of the system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.